Hi everybody, Jorge here, and today I want to talk about the difference between networking in the conventional sense of this word and building effective relationships, business relationships included. Uh, you know, I feel it's really an imperative for me to talk about this uh, because uh, just like so many of you listening, I'm not a native English speaker and what I realized yesterday is that in many, many, many of my videos on this channel where I told you the story of my networking efforts with the book, I probably used the term networking mistakenly. And for some of you who are native English speakers, this mistaken usage of the word might have created a false impression about what I was doing. And, you know, this is such a crucial part of my story that I can't afford to not have clarity around this with y'all. And I also want to share this because my experience of networking, quote unquote, reflects a contextual phenomenon of us having to choose between shallow relationships and profound relationships in all spheres of life. And we have to make this choice, you know, very often. And I want to talk about that choice and the implications that it has. And I think this is a subject that we need to be having more conversations about, actually. So... I realized this mistake with the word networking only yesterday because I came across an article on Inc.com uh, that was titled, uh, Warren Buffett says this one decision in life separates successful people from all the rest. So I'll put a link to this article below, it's an awesome article. And uh, Warren Buffett, for those of you who may not know, is a business magnate and a famous investor, one of the wealthiest people in the world now. And he's, you know, um, he's a gentleman in his 80s, is uh, 88, I think. And he's also an author and a philanthropist. And, you know, so in this article, like, he's obviously... A person who has a lot of wisdom to share because you know you don't get that wealthy just by mere randomness you know uh, there is certainly some wisdom that this person has to share with the world and he has you know this really generous approach of sharing it and you know in this article Warren Buffett was quoted saying that the one decision separating really successful people from the rest is the ability to set boundaries Namely, to say no to the majority of things, ideas, opportunities, relationships come in their way and say yes to those few that really resonate with their heart and their values. And when I read that, I was like, holy shit, I knew this. Like, that's the vital importance of setting boundaries. And I sort of intuitively knew, uh, knew this all along. And, you know, these days I have to do this on a daily basis. Like, I have to constantly say no to suggestions come into my life from so many decisions you know I have to ignore job offers that come to my email I have to say no to my friends advice who see my financial challenges and suggest that I give up my part-time clinical practice and go work full-time for a pharma company because financially that would actually alleviate my poverty here in Russia and you know that choice would actually make my poverty milder but it would still not bring me any uh, it would still not bring me into middle class you know all the while taking up all my time so i'm just so tired of saying no to this advice no matter the good intention it's being given with and i'm tired of explaining to people that my main focus of work right now at the current point of my life is on getting out on finding the opportunity to get out of this country to get out of Russia, where where economic opportunity is so is so scarce, you know, and where also the culture, the social, economic, political climate is so foreign to me and has always been that. And unlike in my early twenties, like in those pre-awareness, you know, pre-awakening years, my focus now is not on getting financially better, staying in this country, because there's anyway very low glass ceiling to financial improvement. And if I stay here in Russia, even though I actually can be less poor than I am now, I will still never, ever be middle class, which I should be. So as my age increases, I realize increasingly clearer this huge necessity to 
keep my focus, my mental focus on projects and opportunities and activities that can truly radically change my life, that can help me actualize my biggest gifts and stay aligned with my truest purpose, that can bring about a meaningful improvement and a crucial breakthrough in my life, not just yield a palliative remedy like switching to work for a pharma company in Russia and getting financially better as a result. Because after all, poverty is not the only thing and not the biggest thing creating trauma in my life here in Russia. And eliminating poverty, although necessary, is not enough to make me happy and fulfilled and open up opportunities for growth that I need. And, you know, so here's the thing about focus. According to Steve Jobs, another very successful person, focus is not even as much about concentrating on the one good thing that matters to you, which in my individual case, for example, is my creative career and my book as its Kickstarter. But focus is mostly about saying, about being able to say, about having the skills, I have the courage to say no to a thousand other good things coming your way. So, Steve Jobs and Warren Buffett and Brene Brown and me really share this sentiment. And I don't know if that's gonna make me successful, but I, I, like, I really believe it because it makes a lot of sense. You have to say no to a lot of things in life, no matter how good they are, and give your time and energy to those few things that, aside from being good, fully resonate with the truth of who you are. But, you know, in order to do that, you have to be aware of the truth of who you are in the first place, which I wasn't, you know, before my pre-awakening years. That truth was, you know, hidden behind layers of trauma and, you know, this imperative of like, living in a society where you have to fit in, where you have to conform, where you have, like, to never be yourself and so on and so on. But when I had this short but life-changing experience of going to Spain, the society that was so different, the society that rewarded authenticity and courage and vulnerability and wholeheartedness, like, you know, my entire life changed because I finally realized where is this place that is my true home, where is my place of freedom and opportunity and the place that I should work to get to, no matter how hard it is from my disadvantaged circumstances. So coming back to focus, you know, keeping your focus gets increasingly harder in a culture these days where overworking and multitasking becomes routine. And in large part, it becomes so because life demands are increasing, you know. While we all only have 24 hours in a day, uh, 365 days in a year, and God only knows how many years, but they are only so many. So this great message from Warren Buffett, uh, to me, you know, like he didn't tell me that personally, but you know, this was sort of message coming to me through this article, coming to me as a person struggling a lot in his creative journey in his journey creating his life, creating his future, and also in his artistic journey at the same time, in his journey towards his dreams, in his journey from a place of oppression and disadvantage towards a place of freedom and opportunity. A person who continues showing up and daring greatly and saying the truth, no matter how many doors privileged Americans have shut in his face over five very tough years, of trying to get his product off the ground. So that message from Warren Buffett is really, really encouraging because it sort of says, Jorge, don't be moved. It's like, you know, it's like that message that Maya Angelou said to Brene Brown when they met, like, Brene, don't be moved. Like a tree planted by a river. But, you know, that, that song that Maya Angelou quoted, like a tree planted by a river, I shall not be moved. So don't be moved. And you know, this message from Warren Buffett this day is coming to me. It's like, Jorge, don't be moved. You're doing everything just about right. Don't buy into this bullshit downshifter's advice. Keep saying no to things and places and jobs and relationships that you know are not aligned with the truth of the life you need to have and the, the life you deserve to have. And most importantly, don't negotiate your no's with anyone. So stop explaining why you're saying no to any, to you know, to another meaningless job offer. Stop like, 
don't explain where you're saying no one your friends invited to go to a party and instead you choose to sit in front of your computer and study another course or another article on intersectionality or empathy. Like, it's okay to say no because it's your life. Your no's define your life. And you have to keep ownership of your life. And Jorge, you have to do that because when you were younger, systems of oppression and the place where you lived and the place where you had this misfortune of being born into stole that sense of ownership and agency from you. And now that you have regained the sense at the cost of going through two excruciating years of multi-drug resistant terminal clinical depression and one year of daily suicidal thoughts, like now that you have come out of that furnace, now that you have regained the sense of ownership and agency over your life, now that you have truly become the other of your life, instead of remaining a character trapped in multiple intersecting systems of oppression, now, even though you still stay in the same place where a lot of oppression surrounds you, don't give away your ownership and your agency again. Keep saying no. Keep saying it in a civil way. And if people insist, don't hesitate to share, to say it in a brutal way. But anyway, keep your focus where it belongs. It's vital. So, you know, th this was a sort of, self of motivational self-talk that I gave to myself after reading that article. Um, because it's the truth. Like, it's the truth. It's the truth about who I am, the truth about where I come from or where I'm heading. And going through my everyday life here in Russia, having to manage multiple aspects of trauma on a daily basis, I often forget to, like, I often forget the truth about my journey. And I, like, I often forget this truth. It sort of, you know, sleeps my awareness. And it's such messages and articles and videos that remind me of it in a real and meaningful way. And you know, the other mind-blowing point in that article, which basically gave me a reason to talk about it in, the, in this video and the title of this video, it was about networking. Uh, this point didn't come from Warren Buffett, it came from Jim Collins, another author mentioned in this article, the author of the best-selling book, Good to Great. And it was still very much in line with Buffett's philosophy of saying no, and it was this. Successful people say no to superficial networking efforts where people just exchange business cards and then never hear from one another. Successful people do not network. They build relationships. And so when I read this, there was another like jaw straight in my heart because it dawned on me that I used the word networking so many times in my YouTube videos, as I told you my story, and I like I obviously used it wrongly, because what I actually meant was building relationships. That is what I was really doing. In fact, I was building real relationships with people over these four years after finishing my novel and reaching out, and starting to reach out. And so when those relationships ended up in betrayals, emotional abuse, gaslighting, and the revelation of hypocrisy, coverage, and greed of privileged American people who portrayed themselves as my allies, as equality champions, as social justice advocates, when those relationships ended that way, and they all ended that way, it effectively created new layers of trauma in my already traumatized life. And so, in my videos, I use this term networking because, like, I, I chose this term because for quite a long time, I just struggled to find the right word to describe the relationship, to describe this, you know, relational process that I was doing, you know, which was basically this, uh, finding people who shared my values on social media, uh, then finding, uh, you know, then, you know, finding people who not only shared my values, but who had some real power, some real position, some real connections to help me with my work. Then reaching out to these people, then building conversations with them in a natural, authentic, vulnerable, gradual, boundary, non-forced way, like without floodlighting people with my vulnerability, without ingratiating myself with them because they could do certain things for me or because they had certain connections by virtue of the privilege. So. You know, I, did, I just didn't know the right word for this process, for building meaningful relationships around my creative project. And so I chose the term networking. But it's only now that I understand how wrong that was. Because the difference between networking and building relationships is huge. 
And it's about the depth and the meaning of connection. It's about, you know, how you see these people you're interacting with, you're connecting with. In networking, which is what middle-class Western people do at parties and academic events and corporate events, you see other people merely as your business interests. You don't really pay attention to their humanity, to their stories, to their spirituality, to their values. But you only see how your career or your business can benefit from them. And, you know, for many situations, it's okay. It's enough. And in many social interactions, you know, it's, it's basically the only thing that is appropriate. But when I began to reach out to people in the American creative industry about my novel, about this innovative creative project dealing with intersectional social justice in a disruptive, groundbreaking way. When I started doing that, I, before even reading any article, any you know self-help book, any psychology book, I intuitively felt that superficial connection with people was not what I wanted, not what I needed, not what would benefit my work, and not what would allow my work to benefit the people it could benefit. So, you know, instead of creating emailing lists of hundreds of people and then pipelining my correspondence, over these four years, I focused on building meaningful, honest conversations with relatively few people, with the people who appeared closest to me spiritually. And I know that Phoenix will say at this point, well, Jorge, that's not how business works. You know, creative industry is an industry in the first place, and it's all about the money, so you have to have something material to give, and then uh, other people will use their positions and their power and their influence to do what you're asking for. But, you know, for me, like, since wholeheartedness was my value, like, instead of cynicism, you know, throughout all my life, and I, you know, I paid a huge price for that, but, you know, for me, since, like, like, even with this particular project, since my main objective with my book was not to achieve any, any material gain, like earn millions of dollars or make my book a New York Times bestseller, you know, like, or, like, receive some award for it. But my main objective with it, with the story, was to give voice to people who are systemically silenced and left out in the culture. I just didn't think that it was a good idea to start conversations with those people I found saying, you know what, here's the thing. I don't know you and I'm not interested in knowing you. Like, I'll pay you this amount of money and you'll put me in contact with the person you're friends with or with the person you have access to because I need to talk to them about my work and there's no way I can contact them myself. Um, I didn't think that was a good idea. I didn't think that could be a good idea to publish a book that, among other topics, addressed systemic corruption by bribing some folks who could put me in contact with those that I needed to talk to. Like, it just made no sense to me. And instead, I began conversations with those people who had connections in the industry on the ground of shared values. Because by default, I assumed that the values they professed on their Instagram pages, in their podcasts, and in their books were actually the values that I were willing to practice and honor, you know. From the start, I just didn't see everyone as a hypocrite, only preaching about social justice, you know, for publicity, because it's a, it's a you know, trending topic. No. I was actually generous, assuming that people are telling the truth about what matters to them. And so I reached out. And then, depending on how people responded, on how much interested or how little interested they appeared to continue the conversation with me, I chose whether to pursue these relationships or to just let go and look for someone new. And so, in fact, instead of networking, I ended up building real, values-driven relationships with people in a gradual, generous, natural way. And even though it was all happening, you know, over many time zones because I never could physically come to America and meet them in person, like, it still felt like I was building relationship, uh, like I was building friendships with them. More exactly, they made me feel like that. By the way they acted, through the words they said, through the commitments and promises they made. And... As some of you know from my other videos, it never turned out well. Because when a certain degree of trust was reached after, you know, quite a while, and, you know, when people's assumptions 
about me and my life that you know were derived uh, that had been derived from my Instagram page were challenged when they learned that despite my Hispanic name I was living in Russia and that despite my you know handsome profile picture of another like Hispanic middle class guy like I was in fact poor and I was a survivor of a lot of trauma and I was still going through a lot of trauma uh, they turned away immediately and they lost any interest in talking to me they stopped telling me how great my writing was. They lost any interest in talking about social justice and talking about my work, uh, no matter how big of that interest they originally expressed. Because as it turned out, I wasn't privileged enough for them to stay in communication with me. And you know, that was really a cute choice on the part of people portraying themselves as social justice advocates and equality champions, to just reject someone and to avoid someone because he didn't have enough privilege. Um, but that's one of the functions of privilege, you know. That, that's one of the functions of having it and not being aware of it. And so over the four years, there have been more than one, more than two, more than a dozen people who made this exact choice. The choice to chicken out of the conversation as soon, as soon as it got uncomfortable. As soon as I sat in a straightforward way that I needed help with my work. As soon as I learned about the disadvantage that I was coming from. Um, and you know, many times after another hope got broken, after another relationship ended up in this like disaster, after another half a year of building a wall, it felt like friendship to me resulted in seeing the ugly true colors of another privileged person. I asked myself, you know, maybe it is just a question of numbers and probability, you know? Maybe I should have reached out to far more people, but in a superficial, you know, networking way, without like getting really, really invested, without getting really meaningful and authentic and profound. Maybe I shouldn't have lost so much time and so much energy and so much emotion on people that I never even met in real life. And, I know yesterday the answer came very clearly from that article, but where the difference between networking and building relationships was, you know, drawn clearly. The answer was, no, I shouldn't have done anything differently, you know, because, like, I was right. I was really right seeing the humanity in people. And I was right wanting to first get to know them as people before going on to business requests. I was right approaching these relationships in a meaningful, profound, and vulnerable, and authentic way, even though those people didn't respond in kind. I was right because it's only this approach that can bring about relational success. And success, of course, takes meeting the right people, which may well be a result of randomness. But then how you approach the people you meet is a matter of choice. It is something that is not random. It is something that you choose. And so approaching them in a real way, in a human way, comes with the risk of getting a far bigger emotional damage in the case of failure than in conventional superficial networking, so prevalent in the corporate world. You know, because how much you lose is the direct proportion of how much you invest. And this principle holds true emotionally and relationally, just as it is true financially. And so I lost a lot because I invested a lot. Uh, and I invested a lot where, in retrospect, I shouldn't have. But, and you know, it's an irreversible loss. Um, but you know, I couldn't know who these people were beforehand. Like, I couldn't, I just couldn't know this. And I can't know this now, and no one can know this. Like, when you meet some person, you cannot know who they really are. You cannot see everyone's true colors immediately. So, your authenticity is basically the right way to see another person's true colors. But then again, it has to be done in a gradual and natural way in a real way, you know, you like you can't bring forth someone else's authenticity by faking authenticity in front of them. And so you can't know who other people are. It's always, you know, a risk. It's like there's always vulnerability, uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. And you cannot know whether their value statements reflect their integrity or just, you know, represent their hustle to be in the trend. Just to talk about things that are 
fashionable, you know, that are in the trend, like spirituality and empathy and social justice, without really understanding or operationalizing the, those things in their life. So becoming interested in people's humanity, in their stories, in their contexts, in their feelings, before being interested in their assets, in their power, in their connections, that is, you know, essentially, a, that is a practice of empathy. And whether you like it or not, it's key to building long-term, resilient, successful relationships of all kinds, from business to customer relationships to friendships to marriage. And that's hard. That's really hard in a culture where increasing value is placed on instant gratification, on fun, fast, and easy, on relationships that involve no vulnerability, no commitment, no strings attached, on relationships where physical intimacy is fast and easy to get, but emotional intimacy should be avoided. And, you know, just let me tell you, but like, when I'm talking about this kind of thing between, you know, the difference between physical intimacy and emotional intimacy, let me tell you, I became especially aware of this sort of cultural inclination that we have as a culture as a whole you know towards superficial relationships i became especially aware of it when i started you know exploring the gay culture in my research and i started communicating with gay men who could help me with my work uh, because that was one of the mistakes that you know i made a lot i thought that you know if my work addresses homophobia and my book does address homophobia among the first and the most important questions i thought that okay gay people should be the first interested to help me with that and that was wrong uh but you know it's another story so when I started communicating with them and, you know, I really started building those relationships in a real, authentic, you know, in this kind of way that I talked about earlier. Like, I wasn't looking for romantic relationships with any of them, of course, but they approached their sort of friendship with me. They called it friendship. Uh -huh. That's how they framed it. In this, like, I, I really, I really noticed it. I, like, it really caught my attention that they approached it, the communication, the conversation, in this superficial, you know, hypocritical, shallow, chicken shit way. Uh, you know, in the way that sort of validated this negative stereotype about gay people being shallow. Uh, you know, and it was really hard for me because this is, this was one of the stereotypes that I did my best to disprove in my book. And I, luckily, I had enough critical awareness to understand that the shallowness and hypocrisy and coverage of those people that became obvious, you know, as those relationships uh, proceeded. Uh, it was related far more to their socioeconomic privilege than to their sexual orientation. But the problem is that it is such people who comprise a tiny, tiny percentile of the LGBT community who at the same time create most LGBT visibility on social media. And their shallowness and their, you know, narcissism and their promiscuity on the background on their, of their flagrant privilege effectively reinforce homophobic stereotypes already existing in the culture. The stereotypes harming the entire LGBT community that in fact is not being represented by these folks that I'm talking about here. And so... Going back to the main topic of this video, my call to y'all, you know, the takeaway message, the sort of takeaway message here is just, you know, be serious about the relationships you build in your business, in your friendship circles, in your love life, even on social media. Even when you don't get to see people in real life, just be serious about the relationships you begin with them. Don't see other people as hot bodies, as cute pictures, as assets, or as ways to get what you want to get. Above all, see people as people and treat them as such, even when the culture encourages you otherwise. Look for meaning rather than pleasure. Look for integrity rather than comfort. And say no, resolute no, and confident no to relationships where you're tempted to betray your goals, to give away your priorities, and to negotiate your self-worth. Nobody deserves that.
So I do hope you take this message constructively. And please, if you have comments and questions, do leave them below. I would love to have a conversation with y'all. And also, if you find this video insightful or helpful, don't hesitate to share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe, and I will catch you next time on Jorge Oro's YouTube channel. Keep telling the truth, be brave, show up, stay curious, and take care. Bye.